Hey, so it's a family Sunday, like Mindy said. So our kindergarten through fifth grade friends who are in the room, you should have gotten a note-taking page when you came in and some crayons. If not, they're at the doors back there. Grab one. There's some fill-in-the-blanks uh, for some of the, of the points for the Bible verse. There's a word search, some questions if you want to draw on it. When you're done, at the end of the service, come show me. I'd love to see it, see how it looks, okay? okay. All right, let me ask you this. Thank you. You don't even have a note-taking page. Trying to get, that's all right. Thank you. Okay. Think about for a minute. The last time you went to the movie theater, saw a movie. Or the last time you watched a movie. Like you're excited about it, You sat down and you watched a movie. And at the very end, when the credits started rolling, what do you do? You stay? So here, here was what a game changer. For many of us, like I, I would... Credits were like, as soon as the lights are on and I can see and don't fall, like, I'm out of here. And like, who, who is the caterer on this film? Oh, yeah, I love that guy. He does great work. I love his sandwiches. Like, you, there's a lot of those roles. Like, we just, people worked hard to make this movie, but when the credits roll. And then Marvel started making their movies with post-credit scenes. That was a little glimpse into something next in the Marvel universe. And you might see there, be there to see Captain America, but it gives you a little scene of an upcoming thing with the Avengers or, and all this stuff. And that sometimes they do two post-credit scenes. So it's like, well, I don't want to leave during the credits. But a lot of times when the credits start rolling, especially if you're at home, it's kind of like, next. You know, you just move on to something else. Think about it a minute for your, one of your favorite. What's your favorite movie? Don't answer it loud, but think what your favorite movie is. Think about it. So mine, I'm going to see if you can guess what the movie is from just this. It's, a, it's in the Star Wars family, but... That's not the right answer. No, it's not Rogue One. It's, it's, it's my, one of my favorite movies. That's, no. <laughs> it's Empire Strikes Back. Thank you. There's several clues on here. Because when, when the credits start rolling on Empire Strikes Back, I actually do stay a little bit longer. Because you see some of these names that's like, oh, there's, I, I love the, the characters. You know, you've got Mark Hamill who played... Luke Skywalker, you have Carrie Fisher who played, you have Han Solo played by, switched it up on you, you have C-3PO played by Anthony Daniels, right? You've got R2-D2 played by Kenny Baker, like, so the further you go down the list, you, you start not knowing. My favorite Star Wars character would say, music and score by John Williams. Like, I love those. And then here, if you're older and you know the show Cheers, Major Derlin was played by John Ratzenberger, who played Cliff on Cheers. And you've got all these names that start appearing in there. And you're like, oh, that guy played this? What's funny is in some of them, it says Jabba the Hutt is played by himself. Like, it, it, it goes through there. And so you see these things, but the further it goes, the less you're like going, I don't know who that is. I don't even know what that job is. Here's why I say that. We have spent the last 35 weeks reading somebody else's mail. The letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome. And it wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. And so as we read their mail, originally the Roman Christians read it and they circulated the letter to other churches. I bet they never dreamed it would circulate as far as Lubbock, Texas. That 2,000 years later, we'd be reading it. But we spent 35 weeks in it, and this is the last week. And, and, and I love that some people have said, oh, I wish we could keep going in Romans. I'm like, well, there's no Romans 17. I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, we're not going to be that church, so it's writing extra scripture. Like, we're, gonna, we're just, you know, you can go back and binge watch it as you read it on your own. That's the encouragement. But in Romans 16, a lot of people will just go, it's just a bunch of names. It's the closing credits. Move to what's next. If you do that, there's two things that would, you'd be missing the opportunity to do. One, we're about to read a lot of names. The Apostle Paul, who is this hero of the faith, who pioneered Christianity in very dangerous waters, and he advanced the gospel. And when he's thanking these people, they may, may be like a main character, or they might be someone who feels like the caterer, but everybody played a vital role in what Paul was doing because it wasn't what Paul was doing, it's what God was doing in advancing the gospel. And for us that are followers of Jesus today, we owe the names we're about to re read a debt of gratitude and thankfulness because of what they did, the gospel got to us. That's why these names matter. 
The other reason these names matter, whoops, some of them, we know some about them. Some, we don't know much about them. But we know about, what we know about all of them is what they did mattered. Because Paul thanked them and because they were part of what God was doing. If you're part of what God's doing, it always matters. Everybody has a part to play in what God's doing. There are no small parts or insignificant roles in God's mission. So if you have a Bible, turn to Romans 16, and let's start looking at these names. Again, it feels like the credits are rolling, but he gives us some information about each one. The first one he mentions is a lady named Phoebe, and he singles her out. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Centrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people, to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. So Paul signifies the first person he gives a shout out to, and he thanks, is this woman. Very unlikely in part, a lot of part of the world at that time, but he uh, gives a shout out to Phoebe. And, it, and he calls her a deacon, or it might be a deaconess, or a servant. Diaconess, it's the, it's the Greek word. It's like she played this significant role of leader. And as a matter of fact, most people believe that she's the one there's a lot of evidence here that she's the one that actually delivered Romans from Corinth to the Roman church. So Paul says, she's critical. She's like a sister to me. She's a servant. And she has been a benefactor or a caretaker of God's people and God's mission. Man, I hope that said of you and of me that, man, we're like a brother or sister to somebody and we are a servant of God and God's people and God's mission and we are benefactor. We're taking care of, patron of the gospel. I hope that's true of us. That's the first piece, person Paul um, gives, gives a recommendation to, real briefly. He just kind of mentions her. Then he goes on. She's number one. Number two, greet Priscilla and Aquila. My co-workers in Christ Jesus. Now, we know that more about them than some of the others on the list. They show up six times in the New Testament, including here. Three times in Acts, once in, in 1 Corinthians, and once in 2 Timothy. And basically, they were, they were Jewish Christians. They, as a couple, converted to Christianity and started following Jesus. And they met Paul, and they let him stay in their home and they partner with him and they were I think originally it's believed they were originally in Rome and then when the Roman emperor kicked out all the Jews didn't matter if you were a Christ following Jew or an old school Jewish faith like if it, they just kicked them all out of Rome and they were probably one of them and they went to Corinth and they started they had hosted a church in their house everywhere they went there was this house in their church and they partnered with the gospel and Paul called them co-workers they risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Everywhere they went, they would put their lives on the line and put their hearts on the table and they would be, serve people. Greet also the church that meets at their house. So he's not just thanking one group. It's tell all that group of people. Because chances are now they're back in Rome and they, what are they doing? They've got a house in their church or a church in their house. Then he goes on. Oh, oh sorry. Here's the, here's the big takeaway from all today. And this is on the note-taking page. Fill in the blank. We all have a part to play in helping others know and follow Jesus. Phoebe had a part. Priscilla had a part. Aquila had a part. Every we see later has a part. And if sometimes I'll, I'll believe that about them, even if I don't know who they are. But I don't believe it about myself. I mean, what, what could I do? What impact could I have? We all have a part to play and helping others know and follow Jesus. Goes on, uh, my apologies if any of you share the name with the people on the screen, if I don't pronounce it right, or if you're related to any of them, if like they're in your family tree or whatever, but I'm gonna do my best. Eponidas, greet my dear friend Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Like sometimes all it takes is someone go first for others to follow. Eponidas went first, I'll follow Jesus. And he singles him out. He says, he was the first one. Greet Mary. A lot of Marys, we don't know which one it is, but greet Mary who worked very hard for you. So with that, all of them, he's giving a little bit of information about here's part of their contribution. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. 
He said, like, I'm here in prison, but I'm not alone. I've got somebody with me, and they've been with me. They are outstanding among the apostles. Now, whether that means they are apostles or the apostles just think they're outstanding, it could go either way. But these are people that stand out, and Paul says, they're matter. I'm thankful for them. And he's telling the Roman Christians, hey, I want you to see how God's using them. And I think one of the reasons Paul's doing it is networking, connecting people, but also saying, he can use you too. God can use you as well. They were outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. They were probably an example to Paul of what it looked like to follow Jesus. Greet Ampli- Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Statius. Like all these names, one after another after another, and he's shouting them out saying, these people did something, it matters. He goes on, more names. Greet Apellus, whose fidelity to Christ, he's been faithful to Christ, has stood the test. I want to know what the test is. You could probably make a whole movie about whatever the test was that he stood. We don't know what the test is, but we know he stood the test because Paul told us. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. Greet Hedronian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. So he's, I mean, he's thanking dozens of people. Great type, great uh, Dryphenia and Tryphosa, those women, women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. And he's going name after name after name after name. And he keeps going, the credits keep going. And the more names he reads, the more you're likely to go, well, what else is on? What's going on in Acts? What's going on over here in Ephesians? No, no, stay with this. Again, why? Because these people, did something that Paul said it mattered. It mattered to him, it mattered to God, it matters to us because they did something to get the gospel to us. It matters for another reason because people like that are just like people like you and me. God can use us in various ways for what he's doing. Greet Rufus, my favorite of the names. Greet Rufus, chosen of the Lord and his mother, Kind of does a shout out to his mom and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. There's a theory out there, and I don't know how widely it's believed, but there's a theory out there that when Paul converted to Christianity, he lost a lot of friends and family. There's some theories out there that said Paul was kind of just all of a sudden ostracized from his social circles when he started following Jesus. And so for him to say, she's been a mother to me, could be that Paul... Didn't have a good relationship with his mother. It says what it says. It doesn't say what it doesn't say. I don't know the story, but he said, she's been like a mom to me too. Intergenerational connections isn't just within families. That's one of the the things we do on these Sundays, Next Gen Sundays, it matters. And then he goes through a lot of names. Greet Asyncritus, Phlegon, 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 Again, if, if that's your name, I apologize, I'm butchering it. Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the other brothers and sisters with him. Like he starts giving, what's that guy's name with Patrobus? He always hangs out with him. What's his name? Uh, just the other guys too. Tell Gomer I said, hey, like, like tell, tell all the people I said hi. Like he starts, I think he starts forgetting people's names. Greet Philologus, <laughs> Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus and all the Lord's people who are with them. There are dozens of people mentioned here. So what does this tell us? Paul, who's this great story of Christianity, he goes from arresting Christians, seeing them be murdered and nodding his head and holding the jackets and then saying, can I get execution warrants for the Christians and go chasing them down? The guy who wants to kill Christians to the guy who's willing to die for his faith as a Christian, which he ultimately does beheaded by Nero. He gives his life for his faith. He didn't do it alone because following Jesus is a team sport. Your faith is personal. You make a personal decision of what you will do with Jesus. But it's not private. A personal relationship with God is never supposed to be a private relationship with God. We're not just on this individualized quest to know God better. We're on a group project 
to follow him and serve him better and help others know him. And it's a team sport. And Paul mentions all these names. He thanks them. He commends them. And he says, this is my team. Some were just placed on his team and some he drafted. He said, you, I need you on my team and I need you on my team. Some of them drafted Paul and said, we want you on our team. Following Jesus is a team sport. In this time of year, a lot of our favorite sports kind of get up and running, right? Like all of our favorite sports about to get going in October with hockey. Like that's around the corner. <laughs> College football started this weekend. That's all I'm going to say about that. It started this weekend. We're glad it's back. How many of you play fantasy football or fantasy hockey or fantasy basketball? Raise your hands. Okay, a good number of us. And fantasy hockey uh, players among us, I, I applaud you. I am a four-time champion at fantasy hockey. Back to back to back, I had a two-year drought where I finished second and third, and then I won it last year again, defending champion. Here's the great thing about fantasy sports. That has nothing to do with what I'm about to say. I just want to put it out there because I beat Ben last year, and he's sitting right over there. Here's the thing about fantasy sports. If some of you look back and go, I don't get it. Like, you, you don't play. Like, you just pick, and they play, and like, yeah, yeah, that's it's great. Because, and, and last night, there were people doing this kind of similar exercise. Uh, you get to be the general manager of your team. Like right now, the Mighty Dugs, my team, has no team on it, no <laughs> players on it, no players. But at the draft, we'll go through and we'll draft, and by the end of the draft, I'll have my team. And let's be honest, last night, there were a lot of people playing a different version of fantasy sports of if I was the athletic director or if I was the coach, I would do this. I'm just gonna do a little, my normal disclosure. The way you talk about coaches and athletes, actors and musicians, politicians and people, they're real people and they matter to God. And yeah, they deserve to be held accountable for their job and you have your opinion, but at the end of the day, just remember, it's a game, for them it's a business, they have families, they're people that matter to God, and the way you start talking about people in sports, sometimes is the way you start talking about people in life. Just be careful, that's all I'm gonna say. But at the same time, I have high expectations for Texas Tech too, so you can, you, can, you can manage the tension. You can manage the tension. So all that to say, in fantasy sports, you get to draft your team. I get to pick who the head coach is. I get to pick who the players are. I get to pick this. In life, you are the general manager of your life. There are some people placed on your team that you don't have choice over. Family. Sometimes people who are in a class or on a team with you. Coworkers. You don't always have choices there, but you have some. But there are other people where you've got to draft your team as Paul drafted. I mean, this is an amazing lineup. How do we know that when we don't know who most of these people are? Look at the results. The gospel thrived and it got to us. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. Find your five. We tell that to people in the next gen, like every person in the next generation needs five people, five different types of people who will know, invest, and help them find and follow and grow in Jesus. Like everybody needs that. Draft your five. I don't think it's just the next generation. I need that too. And I, if I'm in a small group with five people, that doesn't really count because if something goes wrong with that one group or it's not there, I, I need people from five different kind of diff directions in my life. Most of us probably have somebody, but do you have your five? Five's just a made up number, but relationships matter. It matters so much. And you are the general manager. You can draft your team. And it's intimidating because every time in the fantasy hockey draft, when I pick a player, they don't go, oh, I don't want to be on your team. It, it, just, it just goes in. In real life, when you start trying to build a relationship, sometimes they say, no, thank you. Or sometimes it doesn't go well. Or sometimes I don't handle it well. There's all, relationships are tricky. But you know why I know they matter? It's because of lists like this. Because Paul doesn't just talk about the theology of the gospel. He talks about the people who helped him know the gospel and advance the gospel. Relationships matter. It's a team sport. Paul already talked about it in Romans 12, talking about we all have a part to play. You can go back and read Romans 12, 3 through 8. Romans 4, or Ephesians 4, 16. He says this, from him, the whole body, the whole team, everybody is joined and held together by every supporting ligament. 
as it grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. We all have a part to play, every one of us. So what I want to challenge you to do is go find your five. And if you already have your five, or if you have five people, if you have anybody who's helped you know and follow Jesus, grow in your faith, do life, become a better version of you of who God created you to be. If you have anybody like them, do what Paul did. Tell them. Tell somebody else what they've done. Paul couldn't do this, but you could. Send them a text. Tell them face to face, looking them in the eye. <laughs> it's that time of year. Monday Night Football theme comes on. Just like football, Christianity is a team sport. Right on cue. If someone, follow Paul's example. Write them a note. Send them a text. Tell them face to face. Tell other people what they've done for you. Connect people to each other for benefit. Do that. Because it benefits you, it benefits them, it benefits everybody. Then Paul says this. I'm not going to argue with anything he writes in Romans. Except maybe this. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, a little context and a little correction. Culturally, that's kind of what they did. You know, like that was the, the middle, kind of the Middle Eastern, that kind of Mediterranean, you know, you kiss on either cheek or whatever. We'll, we'll say that's going on. How about we just say, let's, Let's NIV or Living Bible this. Let's let message translation. Let's say holy hi high five, right? Like greet each other with a holy high five. It, let's not do the holy kiss thing. Ho holy greeting, holy greeting. Here's why he's saying this. He didn't want anybody when they walk in to go unnoticed. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing them out, but you, you look for people. Hey, I don't know you. Hey, it's good to see you again. Or, hey, how's it going for this? Like, we, we want people greeted. And we try, we make that a high priority here. I hope if you're a guest here today that you were greeted when you came in. But we don't do it just more greeting. We want it to be a connection. We don't want it to be that. So don't worry, introverts among us who are like, okay, holy high five, holy fist bump. We just want to make sure everyone's greeted. And then he says, all the churches send their greetings. Why does he say this? We might skip right over this in the credits and go, yeah, everybody says hi. No, what he's saying is, you're not alone, Rome. You think you're the only church? Remember, you're not. You're not. You got Corinth, where this letter's coming from, and Phoebe, she's key there in the, the little suburb, Centrea, where she's from. Like, she's a key leader there. Like, they're, they're, they're believers there. Hey, they're believers in Galatia, in Philippi. Like, like, like they're, you're not alone, and all the churches are greeting each other. Team Live Oak, following Jesus is a team sport. Team Live Oak's opposition is not Team Southcrest, Team Church on the Rock, Team Hillside, Team whatever church. Those are teammates. My friends who are on staff or attend those other churches, I always want to hear, hey, how can I pray for you? How can I help you? Like, that's not the competition. There are a lot of great churches here. And we, there's a connection between the churches then that sometimes doesn't exist today because it feels like competition. Paul didn't see it that way. Then he says this, I urge you brothers and sisters to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you've learned. So you need to know God's word. And if you hear something that's contrary, you go, well, that can't be right. Watch out for that. Sometimes it happens accidentally. Sometimes it handle, happens purposefully. But he says, watch out for that. For such people are not serving the Lord Christ, Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. You know what he's saying? Your relationships matter. Find your five. And your relationships matter. Be careful who has influence on you. Because relationships will make us or break us. We're wired for relationships. This whole chapter is about, almost about that. They'll make us or break us, but make no mistake, they will shape us. I think I said it last week. If, you, if you're hanging around, if you're here with somebody who you spend a lot of time with, you might just glance over at them. That's a preview of future you. We will, it'll input our language, our choices, everything. We're influenced 
And we are influencers. Relationships matter, so be careful. Don't be casual about it. Then he says this to the Roman Christians. Everyone's heard about your obedience. They are following Jesus faithfully, and it's getting people's attention. So I rejoice because he goes, good job, I'm celebrating that. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. Be discerning. Be discerning. The, grace, the God of peace will, crush, uh, will soon crush Satan under your feet. And this is kind of a, probably a nod, a shout out, a reference to Genesis 3. The promise that when sin and evil entered our world, God's called his shot in Genesis 3 and says, no, I'm going to crush the enemy. That there is a day when evil will not exist in this world. It's going to happen soon. Well, when is soon? Well, it's a little time called you'll see. But it's coming. But right now, there's evil in the world. There's darkness in the world. So be wise about what is good, innocent about what is evil. And then he said, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. And that's, that's kind of what the whole gospel of Romans is about. It's God's grace for, for us. And then he says, oh yeah, I forgot some names. Now these are like the ones that should go at the top of the credits. Timothy, my coworker, this is who Paul discipled and invested in, sends his greetings to you as do Lucius, Jason, and Sospater. Or I, I wanted to call him Sospater, but that's, I couldn't make it work. Sospater. My fellow Jews, I, listen to this, I, Tertius, Tortius, Tertius, I want to say it's Tortilla, I, Tortilla, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Paul's not even writing this down. This guy is writing it for Paul. Why? Lots of theories. Could be his eyesight was going. It could be uh, some kind of restraint. It could be that they wrote multiple copies of Romans and distributed it. And he needed some, his, his hand got that, you know, little crook thing from cramping up. Who knows? But that guy wrote it. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here in Corinth enjoy, sends you his greetings. And Erastus, think about this, who's the city's director of public works. And our brother Quartus send you their greetings. Hey, there are Christians now at different places in government in the Roman Empire. See, this long list of names tells us everyone, and this is a fill in the blank on the, blank on the note-taking page, kids. Everyone can do something to help, know, help others know God better. So what's your something? What is it something you could do? And if you think, well, I'm not old enough, or I'm not this enough, or I'm not that enough, or I'm too this. No, no, everyone can do something. And this whole list of names is just a lot of examples that you can do this. You can. What's your part? What role will you play? And you may not get a shout out like, like from Paul like they did, but the Lord sees it and it matters and he celebrates that. As a matter of fact, Jesus, when he was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he said this, let your light sh shine so others can see it. Kids, this is a note-taking uh, fill in the blank. Let your light shine so others can see it. Then they will see the good things you do and they'll bring glory to your Father who is in heaven. The key is you can shine God's light. Every bulb matters. Every person matters. And, and for our Treehouse Club friends, they're starting a brand new series. They're gonna focus on this truth uh, called uh, Shine Bright. What is it called? Uh, shine, live bright, live bright, live bright, live bright. Live bright, shine Jesus' light. So, so Treehouse Club friends, you're gonna be focusing on this for a while. And I hope every time you think about this, you realize you can do something to help others know Jesus better. You can shine God's light. But J Jesus said it this way, kind of expanding in this passage. He said, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, we're now in that season um, of Christmas. Um, <laughs> and it, I know, it's, it's too early, and it was, you know, is it too early to put up your tree? 
it was never wrong to take down your tree. Like, you can keep it up year round. It's okay with me. Like, I love Christmas. I think about it way too much. True, true confession. Friday, uh, I was at Bible study at Rudy's and, and then got my hair cut and then Hallmark stores there. I, go, I think I'm just gonna go in and look at Christmas ornaments. So that's what I did for a while. Like, I love Christmas. And I think about Christmas lights way too much during the year. And so the thing about Christmas lights that, that helps us understand about this, you can shine God's light. Here's the truth about lights. L these lights cannot shine unless they're plugged in. They need a power source. If you are connected to Jesus, you have all the power you need. If you're not, you don't have any power. Apart from him, you can do nothing. But if you're connected to Jesus, your light can shine. You can do something to help others know and follow Jesus. So they gotta be plugged in. Then they need to be strategically placed. You don't put, you know, get all your Christmas lights and then put them in a closet inside your house and turn them on. No, you put them on the outside of your house or you put them on the tree where people can see it. And chances are, you're already strategically placed where you are. If you are plugged into Jesus and you will just kind of look around and see who God's placed around you, friends, family, people in school, people at work, people on your team, people in the band, things like that. If you will just do that, you might realize, man, God placed me to shine right here. I can shine God's light. I can shine bright right here. But the other thing, and the thing about this, and you don't see this very often, how many of you have driven around looking at Christmas tree, uh, Christmas lights on houses? Okay, for the rest of you, why not? What's wrong with you? Who hurt you? Come on. So, I've never seen this. Have you ever seen this? Have you ever gone to a house and there's just one little bulb? Like they've got a light bulb that's green. And maybe it's green, maybe it's red, maybe it's whatever. Hey, no, there's always more than one, right? Right? Yeah, okay. So here's the truth. You've got to be plugged into Jesus strategically placed. Sometimes God's already done that. Sometimes he says, I want you to go here. But in the end, here's the truth. You need to understand that lights shine better together. If you have one little light, you get some light. The more lights, the brighter it gets. Lights shine better together. And what Paul is saying in Romans 16 is these people did something, but all these people were doing something together. And here's the great thing is even people who don't know each other, we're still on the same mission if we're plugged into Jesus, same power source, and we're trying to help people know him better. It's the same person. We may not know each other, but we're connected in some way, and it matters. And again, kids ministry, the focus of your September series is live bright, shine Jesus' light. And I'm excited for that because it, it, it's this truth of that we're following Jesus is a team sport. Light shine better together. For us in here, we're gonna look at the early church in the book of Acts and some other places and figure out the, the Greek word for church is ekklesia. And we're gonna talk about the church. That's true for any church that what Jesus talked about, but also for this church. Because for us, we're kind of at some critical crossroads. We have some questions we don't have answers to about what's next. In terms of like, it's getting... Uh, crowded. It's not full ever, it's, but it gets crowded. What are we supposed to do? And what about certain parts of our mission? And so we want to talk about, and honestly, I'll tell you, we don't have the answers to those questions. And we've actually strategically been waiting to talk about this together as a church and figure out what do we think God wants us to do? And we're actually going to talk about, hey, here's the process, the tool we're using to try and figure that out. And you're part of it. But the goal of this series is not just this church. It's the church because Jesus had this idea that light shine better together. And he said, I'm going to build my church. So we're going to look at that, about what it looks like to follow Jesus together and what that means. And I just want to remind you tonight, baptism, it's a great time to celebrate people who are taking their next step. And so I encourage you to be there for that. You got all the directions. And let me close this in prayer. And I'm going to close it with the closing words from Romans that, that Paul said. And this is kind of my prayer for you. Heavenly Father, you are the one who is able to establish us in accordance with your gospel. And the message that Paul proclaimed about Jesus Christ, it's the same message for us. And it's in keeping with this revelation of the mystery hidden long in the past for the Old Testament and for hundreds and even thousands of years, there was this idea that the sin, sin and, and what had broken our world, but you would do something about it. And then now, in Jesus, it's now been revealed. It's been made known. 
by the command of our eternal God so that all who are far from you might come to you in obedience that comes from faith. God, I pray you would build our faith. I pray you would help us shine our lights together that we would be connected to you and it would be about you and never about us because you are the only wise God and to you be glory forever through Jesus Christ, amen. All right, thanks for being here. If you'd like to talk, I'll be down at the front and kids, I'd love to see your note-taking page.